Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. As you, as you log in, please put where you're joining from in the chat. And we will be starting shortly. Hello, hello, everyone. Right, we have someone from Knoxville, Tennessee. New York, Chapel Hill. Okay, we have a few people from all over. Hey, Iowa, Colorado, Kansas City, I'm from Kansas. Nice to see you here. Got DC. Hey, we have people from all over. Thank you. Welcome everyone, welcome. California, okay. So we got the East Coast, West Coast, Midwest. All right. Um, so hello everyone and welcome to the Nature-Based Trauma-Informed Care and BIPOC Communities webinar presented by the National Environmental Education Foundation or better known as NEEF. I am Asha Latia Henderson, the Project Coordinator of Health at NEEF. If this is your first time interacting with our organization, we are a national nonprofit working to make the environment more accessible, relatable, and relevant and connected to the daily lives of all. With NEEF located in Washington, D.C., we would like to take this time to acknowledge that the District of Columbia, Maryland, and Virginia are the traditional territory of the Nacoshtank and Piscataway people. With gratitude, we honor the generations who stewarded this land and hope that as we gather today, we will be inspired to collaborate and learn more from each other. Again, we are very excited that you have joined us today. And as we begin, you know, again, I ask that you please drop where you're joining from in the chat. I, see, I do see we have quite a few, so thank you to those who already have. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about barriers for BIPOC communities to get outside and how nature can be used as a tool for wellness and healing. Please note, we will provide all of the resources, a copy of the chat and the recording of this webinar via email in the coming days. I would like to now introduce you to our speaker for today, Brenda Richardson. Brenda Richardson is an eco-feminist that has worked in welfare reform, environmental justice, economic development, education, behavioral health, and other health issues for the past 25 years. She currently serves as a coordinator for the Anacostia Parks and Community Collaborative in Washington, DC, and is the president of Chosen Consulting, LLC. Brenda has extensive experience working with communities of color in the space of health and nature, including working with school-aged children and their parents. So before we jump into the discussion, we would like to take a moment to learn more about you with a quick poll on how you currently work in the space of health and nature. So we're really interested to see, you know, before we jump in, what your knowledge is or just to see where, where, where you're coming from. We have Girl Scouts of Maine. Hey, if you can, everyone, please fill out the poll if you have not already. Vermont. Okay, awesome. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so it looks like about 37% of everyone um, work on public lands. Seems like that the majority work within your communities, some in the health practice, some in the school district, while others work um, in others. So thank you again to everyone who filled, you know, to who completed the poll. So as we're taking, as we're talking about barriers to outdoor engagement, here are some definitions of terms that will be used throughout the discussion. For those who may not know what BIPOC stands for, it means Black Indigenous People of Color, as you see, a green space can range from parks, playgrounds, community gardens, and other vegetative areas, while nature scarcity is a lack of adequate green space. So now we're gonna learn more about some barriers BIPOC communities may face when trying to get outdoors. The first barrier we're going to discuss is nature scarcity and the lack of access to green spaces. So this question is to you, Brenda. So, excuse me, this question is for you, Brenda. 
with communities of color being three times less likely to have access to green spaces than white communities, can you tell us what a lack of green space looks like for the communities you serve? So a lack of, well, first of all, thank you, Asha, for this opportunity to speak before this amazing group from all over the country. Um, and I think that from my experience, a lack of green space is, is when you live in urban communities, there's generally more concrete than there is green space. And in light of the fact that folks are used to that, we give use this as an opportunity to introduce urban communities to the beauty and the health of having access to green space. Thank you. Um, also to the audience, I need to mention that if you would like to learn more about the topic, um, some resources are being put into the chat. Um, okay, so thank you. Thank you for that. So just to follow up, um, you know, with communities you serve living in environments and living in nature sca scarce environments, excuse me, can you tell us more about how your organization connects them to nature and what strategies you use? So is this a good time to talk about the barriers first? Yes, you can okay. jump right in. So I think that first of all, I live in what I call a disfavored community. I think we've used vulnerable a lot, uh, we've used poor a lot. And I think now we're just looking at disfavored communities. And I say that because the barriers, I see three barriers, there's fear, there's an issue of safety, and then the whole issue around trees. So when you live in these kind of dispirited communities, Asha, a lot of times folks are just traumatized. Uh, and you're traumatized by the sound of guns. There's generally lots of gun violence. The escalation of, there's been an uptick in crime uh, in, neighborhoods in the district. I have to be mindful that I have to talk about the district because this is a national audience and they don't know east of the river or Ward 7 and Ward 8. Um, there's a whole issue of safety, like when you're walking in a park. Um, we used to have a walking club in Oxen Run Park, which is the largest park in the city's inventory. And I just remember when we were walking along some passages it just seemed like it wasn't safe. And this is even during the daytime. So what we ended up doing so we could feel safe was we ended up inviting the Metropolitan Police Department to walk with us. Um, and as a result of that, we were able to connect to our parks. Um, I'm a strong believer that connecting to nature is a way to heal our mind, our body and our spirits. Perfect, thank you. No, you know, thank you for telling us more about these barriers. I completely understand and, and agree that it is very traumatic, especially when you're wanting to get outside, but you have this fear of being you know, harmed or if you go outside, there is no vegetation. Um, you know, it's better just to stay indoors, which does um, add to the problem. So when we're thinking about nature access and being outdoors, you did mention safety as a barrier um, to, you know, for BIPOC communities to get outside. Now, depending on the community, upwards of 21 to 36 percent of adults of color have indicated that they have a fear of being threatened or harmed while in their own neighborhood. So I don't know, Brenda, in our last webinar, you mentioned something really interesting about a fear of trees, which I know for me and a lot of our audience members, we were, you know, kind of surprised because I would think trees are never something that you should be afraid of. So considering this, what do you feel are other safety concerns for BIPOC communities to get outdoors? Or if you would like to speak more about, um, you know, what a fear, fear of trees is. So I'm happy that two of my colleagues are on this call, Rob Carletta and Casey U. Taraldi from the Department of Transportation's Urban Forestry Administration. And um, I am happy to say that in working with them, we're trying to change the perception about trees. But the reality is, is that I think it's cultural among uh, African-Americans to have a fear of trees. Number one, because in our community, people can hide behind trees and hurt you. 
Secondly, drug dealers hide their drugs and their guns around the shrubbery or some trees have holes in them and they have a tendency to use it for that. So yes, there, there is this fear. And I just want folks to understand that there are like three kinds of trauma that creates this fear. There is um, first the acute trauma, which happens based on one single incident, which is not what we experience in disinvested communities. The second one is um, chronic trauma, where you have repeated and prolonged exposure to trauma such as domestic violence or emotional abuse. And then finally, there's complex trauma, which I think we experience more often. Um, and that complex trauma turns into collective trauma. And that's an exposure to varied and multiple traumatic events that are invasive and interpersonal in nature. So Asha, that means when you're constantly exposed to gun violence, death, we, our young people see and communities see deaf bodies because when people get shot, the bodies are laying out in the street or on the sidewalk and people are exposed to that. So what does that mean? Trauma in and of itself makes us vulnerable. And when we're vulnerable, the trauma affects our mental health. So that's why I see parks and green space as a as like we're on life support right now and nature is the hospital that's going to give us the ivs that we need to get better does that make sense it does 100 percent. i think you when you're talking about different trauma you know we don't i know for me you know i never really considered there being different forms of trauma i'm thinking trauma is trauma but also when it's you know compacting piling on top of each other and there's no outlet for it, such, such as nature. It's like, what do you do? Do you internalize that? Do you push that out? What do you do? Now, um, you know, understanding that within BIPOC communities, there tends to be a fear of trees or that there tends to be a fear of the outdoors. Now, if we're wanting to get outside, like say, you know, people within these communities of colors, if they're wanting to get outside, but they don't know that they're afraid, what would you say um, are some, you know, strategies or perhaps some activities and, you know, even considering children, ch children typically tend to be the most affected by um, a lack of nature, especially with their physical and mental development. What would you say are some activities that, that children could do? So I will share the activities that children can do, but may I share a story first to put it in context? Absolutely. So some of, there's one child in particular that I work with and he lives in a public housing development and he's 11 years old. And I just noticed that we were out in the park one day, um, I think it was during story time. And I just noticed that he was, he was just so happy to be outside. So I asked the, the woman who was the head of the after school program, what's the story on this kid? And she happened to mention that his, his unit where he lived in public housing had been taken over by the drug dealers. The mom was addicted to drugs and she allowed him to come in so she didn't have to pay. So this little boy spent most of his time in his room. So there's fear there that he's not only gonna be harmed in his home, but the fear that already exists about being harmed outside. So when I saw this little boy and his response to programming in the park, it made me realize the gravity and the depth and the value of nature-based trauma-informed programming and the ultimate impact that it could have on our little ones who are so wounded. And I, I just think it's, um, a wonderful opportunity. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we had two scientists uh, come to uh, the park. We had 30 kids in a program and the scientists were from the Audubon Society. And what they did was they were teaching kids about worms. So they brought these little, um, little, I don't know what you call them, where they dig the holes. And so the 
fascinating thing was watching these kids have their hands in the dirt. And then when they found a worm, they were just fascinated. And then they got to see it through a microscope. So I think the beauty of this kind of programming, Asha, is that it gives our children in disfavored communities a sense of hope that you can be in that space for an hour, even though you got to go back home to whatever your trauma is. But the notion of giving them an hour of freedom, of healing, is just so critical. And that's why I'm such a champion for nature-based trauma-informed programming. Thank you. Um, so I have a follow-up question to that. So understand you have some children who are who are unable to get outside or whenever they are, you know, it's dangerous. I'm thinking of school age children or work, working with children, um, you know, working with teachers as well, because I know that that is something that, that that you do work in. Do you have any um, strategies or any examples or any stories of how teachers can get children outside more, especially when their environments may not be safe? So, yes. Um... We've got lots of parks in the District of Columbia, so I try to use as many of them as I can. And uh, there was a private school that wanted to uh, have an adventure, if you will, for their kids. And these were not children of color. And um, these kids, we did forest bathing with them. They were just so fascinated by it all. And for those of you who don't know forest bathing, you, you get to see, touch, smell, um, and listen uh, to nature. And they were cloud watching. And they were just really struck by it because the kid said, oh, I never noticed that there were clouds up in the sky. Uh, they also had an opportunity, and people think this is ridiculous, but there's something about hugging a tree. It's like connecting you to Mother Earth by just hugging a tree, and it was just a really, really fascinating experience for them, and they brought their journals, so they were each able to either sit at the stream or sit under a tree and write in their journal. And that was a really, really rewarding experience for that group of young people. That's awesome. I think definitely, we never think about grounding, like actually getting outside, getting on the ground, taking your shoes off, feeling the grass, connecting with nature and how important it is. Cause you know, I'm thinking I am not taking my shoes off and getting in the dirt that that's gross. But also, you know, truly going back, like, what is the benefit of doing that in a safe environment, of course. Now, definitely in, in urban settings, they tend to have a lot more concrete, as you were saying. And with, um, you know, the climate changing or with, you know, the, the climate weather events changing, such, such as, you know, times of extreme heat. And that typically does cause, as you were saying, you know, a spike in mental health crises, as well as a spike in violence. Like in terms of heat, the, ur the urban heat island effect, what would you say are some strategies or, or what, what would you say um, to, to, to get outside or maybe, you know, times of day to avoid if, if, if the heat's too high or there's a, um, you know, a, a greater likelihood of, you know, being hurt, let's say, you know, during the morning time, you know, it's best that, that, that you stay inside or during five to 6 PM, it's best that, that you remain indoors or, you know, there's even, you can still enjoy nature. Even looking at a picture can improve your mood, improve your mood. So heat, heat sensitivity is something that I'm extremely interested in. And I've been working very closely with our Department of Energy and the environment to learn as much as I can about it and the Urban Forest Administration. And I am just, so there was, you can see that there's a correlation when, when the heat escalates, there's an S, there's a uptick in violence. It's just extraordinary. And when, in our community, our tree canopy is not as robust 
as it is on the other side of the city. There's an Anacostia River that divides our community from the rest of the city. And so I, I'm just so grateful that our urban forestry division is making a monumental uh, attempt to plant as many trees as they possibly can because Asha, the reality is when you're surrounded by concrete and it's hot and you're not cool, you get angry. And in your anger, it affects your mental state and your mental state affects your behavior. And subsequently, I attribute that to the, the reason that we have so much gun violence and so much crime when we just need shade to cool off. Uh, and people don't understand how at least in our communities, how valuable the shade is. Uh, when you live in public housing or in section eight housing, a lot of time there's no central air conditioning. So folks have to depend on the trees outside in their yards or, or um, like in my neighborhood, folks that we don't want in our neighborhood will pull up their lawn chairs and sit on our sidewalks to cool off. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to share as it relates to uh, getting people more connected to trees and strategies as it relates to the heat islands is I'm so lucky uh, to, have, to have a relationship with urban forestry because we've done something that happened quite by accident we started something called memory forests. And in, we were able to connect trees to gun violence. Can you believe that? So what happened was a mom said, my son died, I wanna plant a tree. So as a result of that, there were eight people who found out about it. We ended up planting these eight trees in, uh, Oxen Run Park, and we call it the memory forest. So as a result of using that approach, culturally, that's more acceptable to plant a tree when you're planting it in the name of a loved one and not seeing it as a bad thing. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for that. Um, now, I know going back, you, you mentioned a little bit earlier about nature-based trauma-informed care. And I know that may be um, you know, a, a new term that some, some people may not have heard about. Now, is it, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Like what, what is nature-based trauma-informed care? Well, to me, it's when you integrate nature into mental health programming. And mental health programming is, is, what I compare to outdoor learning. Um, and we had to become creative. And especially during the pandemic, I think that a lot of folks just adopted this sedentary lifestyle, at least in, in our communities. Um, and I'm one of them because, and again, Asha, it was out of fear fear that we were going to get COVID and that we were going to die. So you just don't go anywhere. And then we got used to not going anywhere. So as, as this nature-based trauma, we started having um, uh, these different uh, groups for the adults. And they were just overwhelmed uh, by being inside. And thank goodness our mayor said, the one place you can go and be safe if you practice social distancing is to the park. So we had these different groups uh, because folks were just like, I need a break. I just need a break. So we had these, uh, we called them trauma breaks uh, in the park. And what we did was, this was for the adults. We had yoga. Uh, we had a yoga instructor who came and did yoga with us. And then afterwards, we formed this circle and we had an opportunity to just talk about how we were feeling. And it got really emotional at times because we found that it was a safe space and we were so scared. And many of us sat in that circle and cried. But 
it was a testament to our declining mental health, but it was also a testament to nature-based trauma-informed programming helping us to start to heal. See, I think that, that that is really powerful, especially with communities of color, people of color, you know, trauma is compounding from different directions. And I feel that we're never really taught how to process it. It's more of just bury it deep and keep pushing it forward. So to think that nature can be a tool, it's all around us, but it may not be accessible um, for, for us to use to, to heal ourselves. Now, I do see a couple comments in the chat, thank you, thank you so much to everyone. If you do have a question, please put it in the Q and A, and I will try my best to get to them as you know, as as we're going through. But we do have a few comments, Brenda, about um, the memory force. You know, some people are saying it's a great idea. Can you talk more about it? Like, how how would someone go about setting up a, a memory forest? So it all depends on who the tree agency or partners are in your city. And we have two. Uh, the Urban Forestry Administration plants trees on public land, and uh, Casey Trees plants trees on private land. Uh, and the trees are free, so it didn't impose any financial burden on folks. And if you're in a place where you are trying to uh, improve your tree canopy, I'm sure there are avenues where you could connect with your tree agency or nonprofit to form a collaboration to start um, to start memory for us. And then when you go into communities that are are wounded, um, I think it's just important. I I often talk about uh, how we listen with wounded ears. Um, and I just think because it's, it's important that we are aware that you are aware that we are mourning, that we are grieving, and that we're not going to be able to just snap out of it and have a tree planting. It doesn't work that way. Uh, because, you know, a lot of times I've been at tree plantings where there were lots of volunteers and we get exhausted by the collective trauma. So it's one thing to go out and plant a tree because you're volunteering to plant, but it's something else when you're grieving and you're mourning and you're wounded and you're exhausted, but you're planting this tree in the name of a loved one. And then what happens is, you know, people celebrate the birthdays of those loved ones. There was one celebration where they had a birthday party. They put balloons on this little baby tree. And they also have these stuffed animals that they put around um, places where folks were shot. So now they're putting those stuffed animals around the tree. So that serves as some significance uh, for those families. So I would say just establish a collaboration with whoever handles the trees and work it out so that there's no cost um, imposed on the family. And I also wanted to say that we've worked with the Girl Scouts. Uh, we had a wonderful experience with a Girl Scout troop. I see there's someone here representing the Girl Scouts and they came to our park and they made, made bird houses. And um, I think the wobbler is the bird in our community. And they hung the birdhouses up in the trees. It was, it was just fabulous. So trauma-informed uh, programming in nature is just about being creative um, and doing things that will connect uh, to communities of, of color. And there's no one formula that works for everybody. That's why there's so many different things that we do, because we try to be very mindful of what different neighborhoods are experiencing so, so we can help them to heal. No, absolutely. I think, you know, tree planting is, you know, some people think when, when you're upset, when you're frustrated, when you're experiencing trauma, they say breathe just breathe it through, which it does, you know, breathing does definitely calm you down. But sometimes it's like, you know, I don't want to breathe. I want to scream. 
Yeah. I want to hit, I want to throw, I don't know what to do. And I can't do anything because if I do, then I'm seen as a threat. So, you know, planting a tree, I think it'd be really great because although your loved one may not be there with you, you still have something in memory of them. You can still pour love into it. You can still pour water into it. You can still make sure that, that, it, that it's thriving, especially when there are, there are other trees around, you know, then you know that that, that person is no longer alone. Yeah. so to speak. Now, um, we do have one question. Now, you, you've you kind of already touched upon this. The question is, how can we, you know, address this in a more, more holistic way um, for, it sounds like, you know, intergenerational trauma, especially within bike clock communities. We talked about um, tree planting, talked about being, being mindful. What would you say is another way, um, you know, to, to approach, you know, trauma in, in BIPOC communities from a, a different angle? So I, I think that it's important to meet people where they are. Um, and what do I mean by that? That like um, I, I work with after school programs and public housing and in schools. And um, I remember going to the public housing community and and it's it's not gonna happen overnight because just because you show up and you have this expectation, oh, I've got these great programs for you guys. It doesn't mean that they want them. You have to take, you have to invest the time, number one, to be thoughtful about their environment. Number two, to understand the depth of their trauma. And number two, number three, Asha, I think the biggest thing is just being kind. Um, one of the things that I've learned is, is there's an appreciation for a soft voice and for kindness because everything's so loud for us. The gunshots are loud. The sirens from the fire department and the police department are loud. They have fireworks in our community all year round. So there's a real appreciation um, for a soft voice and kindness. But if you're not willing to invest the time, then you're wasting your time. Because this doesn't happen just because you show up and you've got an opportunity. And the other thing is trust. Um, so many people come into BIPOC communities and make promises that they don't keep. So there's, there's the fear that you're gonna abandon us. You've got some money to do this and when the money's gone, you're gone. So you've got to prove yourself that you're invested and that you're going to be around whether the money is there or not. Was that helpful? No, I 100% understand. It's, it's the fear of like, um, you know, thank you for, for being here, but what do you want from me? Yeah. Are you just helping me to help yourself look better? Or are you truly coming here to, to help me? And also say if it's someone who may not be from a community of color looking in, it's like, what, what do you know about me? How can you really help me? And so there may be that, that barrier of, I don't feel comfortable doing this anymore. So I may not interact as much as I can, or they are interacting. They may not getting what, what, what they need on the other end. And the other thing, Asha, is that the people who are doing the programming cannot show fear. You cannot show fear. And I'll give you an example why. So it was a, a few weeks ago, I went to the public housing development where I worked with them in their, on their property and in the park. And uh, two days before I got there, the uh, director of the program had brought the kids home on a Saturday from an event that they had in the park. So she was walking all the kids home on a Saturday. Well, the last two kids, she got caught in a courtyard in crossfire. And one of the bullets came through the back door of the center where the kids um, do their after school programming. And so when I went into the center, I'm like, well, cause they usually have two rooms with the kids. I'm like, well, why is that room closed? And she said, because the bullet is still there. So I say that to say, nobody ever came and talked to those kids about what they were exposed to 
That's unaddressed trauma that happens every day. And nobody came and took the bullet out of the door. So, so I hope that you can see that there's so much unaddressed trauma that folks are expected to deal with. No wonder our mental health is off the chain because we're not dealing with it. There's no expectation that, Brenda, let me grab you and take you to the park and let's do some forest bathing. Let's sit by the stream. There's something called cupping where you put your hands behind your ear. I love cupping because you can hear the ripples in the stream and it calms my spirit. And we need things that will calm our spirits because we're always in flight or fight, always fight or flight. And so I think that we have an opportunity. Nature is free. We don't have to pay for it. Green space is free. And I think that more people need to take a deeper dive into how green spaces can heal. Because I really, really think that it's something special that should no longer be ignored. Absolutely. I think leaving the bullet in the in the wall can be a metaphor of you're not valuable enough for me to ensure yeah. your, your safety yeah. is protected. It's just, and maybe that the door was shut as like, hey, this is the best we can do with what what we have right now, which may be accurate, but still it's knowing as a child or just as a person, maybe as a parent or a loved one, that there's a bullet in the wall and your child has to keep going back there day after day and it's still there. Um, and Asha, and, and, and not to cut you off, but the other thing you reminded me of that makes a huge difference is nobody ever asked these, not just the kids, but the adults, how are you today? That very simple question, how are you today? that goes such a long way uh, because we just assume that just because we see you that everything's okay and but it's not it's it's just not yes let's say a, a smile can save a life you never Indeed. know what someone is going through and just by you opening up the door you giving a smile you complimenting someone can truly save their life so we are getting a few questions so thank thank you everyone um, so I do have a question that says, is there, is there also specific, um, is there a, a curriculum that, that you follow, um, you know, should mental health professionals, professionals be involved in, in these instances? So is there, is this just something that, that you have created over time? Is there like a, a strategic plan that, that, that you've been following? How have you created these ideas? I know that may be an, a compound question, but are there, is there, is there a curriculum that, that you're following? So no, there is not a curriculum, uh, but what I will say, because I saw somebody put something in the chat about police, what I will say is that one of our strategies is creating programming with the police in the park. And uh, uh, we have story time every summer in a park that has an amphitheater Last year, we had 80 kids, and I think we have some slides to show at some point. We had 80 kids, and we have police officers read books to the kids, and our local DC Public Library donates a book. So what that does is the kids are in the park. That I love that picture. That I love that picture. Um, the guy from the library was singing some kid song. I don't have any kids. I, well, my son is grown, but he started singing this song and all the kids got into it. And you can see the police officer is into it too in the back. And uh, every kid has a book that the library uh, donates to them so they can create a library in their own home. But you see, even though they have on masks, those are some happy kids right there. And this is uh, our story time in the park uh, with MPD. And it's, it's just a beautiful thing. And unfortunately, I wish I had the wherewithal to write curriculum, but I am traumatized too. And I have to be honest about that. And there's only so much that 
that we are able to do in our exhaustion. Uh, but my goal is to create healing spaces in green spaces for our community that is exposed to collective trauma. And that's any BIPOC community. It's, it just so happens that most of the folks that I work with are African-Americans, but it makes a difference. I think it's really great, <clears throat> excuse me. I think it's I think it's really great that you recognize your your limits. Because oftentimes, especially when we want to help people, it's like you want to pour and pour, but you can't pour from an empty cup. Yeah. Um, so it's like, you know, how can you help people while also protecting yourself? And I do find that that to be a case, especially with a lot of community health workers, um, a lot of mental health professionals, a lot of uh, you know, providers, or though those that are working with within within the, these communities. Now, um, I do have one additional question. On top of that, like how, can you speak more about your work working with mental health professionals? Like do, do you involve them in your activities at all or in, in your planning? So I have to tell you, I'm a social worker by profession and um, we have a department of behavioral health and they are overwhelmed. And we have not, we have had one opportunity. I've been doing this for five years now. Uh, three years, I'm sorry. It's five years with the police. Um, and we had one experience with the behavioral health group and they brought out a van. And, and I don't know, Asha, there seems to be a disconnect. Yay, Jacqueline Thomas, shout out to the social workers. Um, um, there seems to be a disconnect. However, the police department is working something out where they will have mental health professionals on site with them when they go to crime scenes and stuff like that. I, I just, I, we just, so first of all, we don't have the energy to keep going back and forth to a government agency to ask for help. Uh, so we've been pretty lucky uh, to work with other people who will volunteer their time to come and do things with us, like the folks at the Audubon Society, those scientists, they came and did that for free. There was a young, another young man, Taiki, who started the Black Birders. He came and did, brought, um, God, I'm losing my words. What are the binoculars? He brought, he brought binoculars so the kids could go bird watching. Um, so um, we have not, so I, I think what I do is how I weave mental health is just by being present for, for me to be present and to pay attention. Um, sometimes uh, a kid, because you got to pay attention. And when you get to know the kids, a kid may just need a hug that day with whatever is going on um, with the activity. He may just need a hug while he's doing the activity. We also have art in the park. Uh, George Washington University has this wonderful art reach program that is free. And they come over with these canvases and oh, the children, so they have to paint what they see in the park. Extraordinary pictures of trees and birds and grass and the sky, and they get to take it home. So there's just lots of different things that I've been so fortunate. Oh, but you know what was really fascinating? There was a guy that played a cello and he taught them math through writing music notes. So I was like, yeah, yeah, right. And then a parent came back and said that her daughter was doing much better in math as a result of this musical mathematical experience. So it's just about being creative and seeing what's available because I think anything positive is going to positively affect your mental health. 100%. And yeah. going off of that, I know you were talking about, um, you know, 
it, it's tiring having to go to agencies to ask for money, to beg for money. Some sometimes, and you know, just having to start things yourself. I remember because I, you know, personally grew up in, in, in one of these neighborhoods, and my mom always told me, like, you know, no one's coming here to save you. You need to save yourself. Yeah. So you need to work and figure it out. And it's incredibly difficult, but you make do. I think it's not because you want to, it's because you have to. Um, yeah. which is, you know, it's that's kind of the theme, especially for for people, um, people of color in general, but also within communities of color. Now we are um, we are about to transition to our Q and A. I do see that that there are a few questions in the chat. Thank you guys so much again. If you could, um, if your questions have not been asked yet, please put them into the Q and A, and we're just going to go through and see if we can get through as many as possible. But thank thank you again. Um, okay, so the first question to you, Brenda, is community health workers play a vital role in the health of neighborhoods, but community health workers have varied levels of training. Have any evidence-based competencies been, been identified for training in nature-based trauma-informed care? Um, this particular person says, in my field of nutrition, there are 38 competencies that are important for community health workers to demonstrate in order to carry out, carry out high quality activities for improved nutrition. Wow. Who is that from? Um, it's from, if the person's comfortable, it's from uh, Herbs, Herbs, Barbara, Herbs. Barbara, that is a great question. I don't think I've ever seen a community health worker in our neighborhood. I know, and, and I really mean that. I'm, I'm just really struck by that question. And in light of how the pandemic exacerbated our health disparities, I'm, I, you know, I have to really start wondering about that now, but I do know that, uh, we have 80,000 people in my neighborhood and we just got a new grocery store. We only have, have had one grocery store in our community for years with 80,000 people. So I'm saying that to say that in the major grocery store, there is a nutritionist uh, who sets up shop there, I think every Wednesday. Uh, and, uh, but you're right, nutrition is so important. And, but Barbara, one of the things we tried to do, I remember years ago, uh, the public housing development is called Berry Farms. It's not there anymore, but years ago, we had to get to the owner of a corner store to ask him not to open up the store until 10 o'clock because the kids would stop at the store before they go to school and buy candy and they're bouncing off the walls by the time they get into the classroom. So I really, really appreciate the thought of paying more attention to health and nutrition because when we provide snacks, we usually do, we don't do chips and cookies, we do granola bars and fruit. Uh, Sometimes the kids don't like it, but they're getting used to it because it's better for them. Thank you. I know definitely new nutrition. It's a whole, you know, a whole other bag, um, you know, and, and health and equity, definitely with mental health, physical health, especially with, with children, um, it is a major issue that oftentimes gets overlooked. Now we do have another question. Um, so say, you know, someone's saying that, you know, if if they don't normally work with BIPOC communities or they, they really want to know, but they don't they don't know where to start. You know, do you have any suggestions on the best times of day or the week to increase participation? Say, hey, it's best to do it on Saturday or depending on the culture or the environment, sometimes, um, you know, not hosting events on Sundays because people typically tend to go to church. Um, you know, depending on, on the environment. So do you have any recommendations or, or suggestions for the time of day or um, the, the day to, to increase participation? Well, BIPOC communities always have community leaders um, and that's a great place to start uh, to get some history on the community, uh, uh, and to figure out what works best because all neighborhoods are not the same. Uh, 
I don't generally do things on weekends because folks just don't turn out. So uh, especially when I'm working with the kids, I usually do it after school. Uh, during the summer, we do it during the day. And the same with the adults. They'd rather have the weekends to themselves unless it's some huge festival or something. But for local programming, the, I find that the weekends don't generally work. But in BIPOC communities, it depends on what the leaders of those respective neighborhoods have to share because every neighborhood is different. Absolutely. No, thank you. Thank you for that. And like one follow-up question would be, I know you mentioned that, um, you know, there being a lack of community health workers and social workers as well in, in BIPOC communities. Now we did have a question from a physician or just, uh, you know, someone asking about a physician, say if a, um, a person is coming to their, their doctor and, you know, they're showing signs of maybe nature deprivation or the physician is, 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 noticing that, that they may, um, you know, have some, you'd say like vi vitamin D deficiency and they, they need to get outdoors, which I know is, you know, there, there are mul multiple reasons for that. If they live in unsafe environments, what can physicians do to encourage them to get outdoors? Or are there any strategies that, me you know, med medical practitioners can, can do to I guess, approach the, approach the topic? I love that question. We have walk with the doc. And it's been incredibly successful. There is an RX in the park program here and doctors actually write prescriptions for people to walk half an hour, 20 minutes in the park. And uh, when we did, someone mentioned a treasure hunt. That's what the doc did. Uh, she was she was amazing and and she was telling the kids because she made them take their true shoes off and walk in the grass and they're like really you want me to walk in the grass and she said yes and but you know what they felt better afterwards uh, but she connected the grass the tree the streams to things like preventing uh preventing different kinds of diseases, obesity and cancer. And, and they were just so struck by what she was saying out of all the people I've had who worked with my kids, she's the one that got all the hugs uh, because she sent them on this treasure, on this treasure hunt. But, but I, I will say this too, as it relates to physicians, if we're not able, because I believe that doctors prescribing walks is critical to the well-being of BIPOC communities. Because if we walk, it reduces our blood pressure, it, it reduces our numbers for diabetes, it reduces our pounds. And I would love, but there has to be, like I'm working with the Department of Parks and Recreation to start walking clubs. Because if you tell me that I've got to go take a walk for an hour, and I have to do it by myself, it's not gonna happen. But if I know that there's a walking club that I can join and, and fulfill my prescription, then I'm more likely to do that. And especially if I'm walking with the doc, because if I have some questions, I can ask the doc while we're walking. Thank you. I think that that is great when you're thinking, Prescribe nature. Like what? Do, what do you mean? Prescribe nature? It's like great. I need to go outside and walk. Like why? Why is it important? Why? Why do I need me to go out and walk if I can't get outside to walk because maybe I don't feel safe? What? What else can I do? I know. Um, you know, tying it back into the nature-based trauma-informed care. I believe we do have a picture of um the children doing yoga yeah. outside. Can you talk more a little bit more about that? Like what were the the benefits of getting children out outdoors and how, how did you put this together? So what we did was, since we had 80 kids showing up for story time, we decided that we would have several other activities after story time, because if you participated in one of the activities, then you got to get a cup of ice cream 
afterwards because it was extraordinarily hot those days and the kids love ice cream um so uh this is a black yoga instructor and she is fabulous and she talks the kids through the yoga and they were so incredibly responsive uh, because she said sometimes do you feel like hitting somebody but that's the reality our kids hit each other and and the kids were looking at each other like how does she know and then she said well this is a practice that you can do when you start feeling that way. Do you get angry? This is a practice. So this is just when she's starting out, uh, but she showed them the different poses and they actually did quite well. That's but the amazing. yoga instructor has to be able to relate to the kids. 100%, I know. Me personally, I started doing yoga because I recognized that, you know, mental and physical health of benefits of it. I, you know, went into it thinking that yoga was easy. It's not. It's not easy. And it's always best to partner with someone else that way. You know, you can have fun, almost struggle together, but also grow, grow together. So it is great, especially for, for kids. It allows them to, you know, interweave mindfulness into everything they, they do. That way in the future, they know, okay, these are poses I can do. These are, this is how I can meditate. This is, these are ways that I can calm myself down because I was taught how to do that as a child. And um, I think that, I think that uh, data shows that when children meditate, they do better in school. So I think that uh, yoga and meditation, uh, well, personally, I think they should be in the schools. And one of the things that we're trying to do, we tried for several years with a coalition. We've got a lot of schools in our community that have parks in their backyard and they've taken physical education out of the schools. And we were trying to work with them so that they would at least allow the kids to take a nature walk at some point during the course of their day but we weren't very successful at making that happen. Kids need to be active, they need to move. And um, you know, when you live in concrete communities, it's all, it always seems so dark, but you see how green that grass is um, in those pictures, it just lifts your spirit. And so I think there's great value in that. And I just want to say one more thing, because we're almost coming to an end, is I am just so delighted that all of these folks are here. And I value all the things that they put in the chat and their questions. And I want to value and honor each and every one of you for the work that you're doing wherever you are. And the information you have shared, I've been trying to concentrate and look at what you're putting in the chat at the same time. But I, I appreciate your, your thoughtfulness and most of all your mindfulness for being a part of this discussion. Oh, th thank you, Brenda. You've been an amazing, amazing speaker, a lot of strategies. And definitely, as you can see, you know, people are really interested in it. And I know I, I'm sure I can speak for myself as well as them. We say we would love to have you back. We would love to know more. There are a few questions um, that we were unable to get to get get to, which I do apologize, but that just lets us know that there is a need, there is a desire, you know, to want to know more, to want to partner. So thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to the audience for being so engaging, for showing up, for asking questions. We do we do appreciate you as well. So again, just as a reminder, we will be providing all of the resources we talked about. Um, we we talked about today. A copy of the chat will be provided along with a recording of this email that that will be emailed to the email you use to register for the event. Also, if you know of someone who was unable to uh, register for the event or was unable to attend. Neef will be putting this on our webpage and on our events webpage, along with our last uh, nature and health webinar that you'll be able to share with whomever you, you decide to, or whomever would, would, would like to learn more about it. But again, thank you to everyone. Thank you again, Brenda. You guys have been amazing. Um, you know, I look forward to maybe in the future doing another, um, another one of the series. So with that, everyone, please be safe, happy holidays and take care. Thank you again.
Bye.